Join our WhatsApp group to get daily latest updates. It's totally free. You will hear a man arranging to get a telephone connection. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 4. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 4. This is the Clearpoint Telephone Company Customer Service Office. My name is Ms. Jones. How may I help you? Yes, I'm moving and I'd like to arrange to have a phone line installed. Of course. Let me get some information from you first. May I have your name, please? It's Kramer, Harold Kramer. And would you spell your last name for me, please? K-R-A-M-E-R. M-E-R. Got it. Okay. Could I have the address where you'd like to have the telephone connected? That would be number 58 Fulton Avenue, apartment 12. Is that a business or a residence? A residence. It's my new home address. Then the type of phone service you want is residential, not business? Yes, yes. It's for my home. All right. Fine. Now, let me get your employment information. Who is your current employer? I work at the Wrightsville Medical Group. Then your occupation is doctor? Uh, no, I work for the doctors. I'm the office manager. Now listen and answer questions 5 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 5 to 10. Okay, and could I have your work phone number? It's 637-555-9014. 9014, great. Just one more thing. I need to know how long you've been at your current job. I've been working there for quite a while now. Let me see. Eight... No, nine. That's right. Nine years. Okay, good. You've been there long enough, so I don't need to ask about any other work history. Now, in addition to our basic phone service, we have several special services available. Could you explain them to me? Most customers opt for unlimited long-distance service. It really saves you money if you make a lot of long-distance calls. That sounds like a good idea. Then I'll put you down for long-distance service. Another popular service is voicemail. Voicemail takes all your messages electronically, and all it takes is one simple phone call to retrieve them. Hmm, voicemail. No, I don't think so. I have an answering machine to take my messages. It's old, but it still works fine. We also provide Internet service, if you're interested in that. I am. Please put me down for internet as well as phone service. Right. Okay, I think we're almost finished. I just need to schedule a time for the technician to go to your apartment and do the installation. Let me see. What about next Tuesday? Would that work for you? Uh, no, not Tuesday. I'll be at a conference all day. Wednesday would work, though. I'm afraid I won't have any technicians in your area on Wednesday. I could send someone on Friday. That would be fine. What time of day works best for you, morning or afternoon? Morning would be best. All right, then. It's on the schedule. Do you have any questions? No, I don't think so. Thank you for calling ClearPoint.
That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a talk at an open day at an alternative health club. First, you have some time to look at questions eleven to fifteen. Now listen carefully and answer questions eleven to fifteen. Good morning and welcome to the open day of our new alternative health club here at Chelsea Bridge. I have to say it is very pleasant to have so many people turn up. My name is Harry Wilkinson, and I work as one of the nine permanent staff members employed here at the club. The main aim of the open day. Is to give you a quick tour of the building, but before we do that, I'd like to introduce you to a few people employed at the club. Not all of us are here at the same time. In case you need to contact any of us, our contact details are here on the notice board below the photographs. First of all, this is Sean Bond, who is the technical manager, and his job is to supervise equipment. Like computers and all the electrical equipment, and this is Margaret Lloyd. Her main function is to oversee training, and she is therefore in charge of all the full and part-time therapists. The next important person I need to introduce you to is James Todd. He is our liaison officer. What he does is manage bookings for the club rooms and equipment. As they are open to different organisations, from the local college to corporate clients like banks and so on. Last but not least is our physiotherapist Edward Marks, who works part time Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Edward plays an important part in the life of the club. His main role is to prevent injuries. Before you hear the rest of the talk. You have some time to look at questions sixteen to twenty. Now listen carefully and answer questions sixteen to twenty. Now for the various amenities, you see that the club has quite a large capacity, and is arranged over three floors. There is a lift by the reception and the stairs. On the ground floor, there are two large halls which are used for yoga, tai chi, pilates, and dance and fitness classes for different age groups. With a shop and cafeteria over here, on the first floor we have a full range of fitness machines, which are available in the large central hall, around which there are various offices. The changing rooms are also on this floor. On the second floor, there is a series of small therapy rooms with waiting areas for clients. These may be booked by individual therapists. There are also three classrooms. Which are used for teacher training and group therapy classes. We have a very extensive therapy training program accredited to the University of Manwich, with training in counselling.
for which we have three programs at the moment. As regards the various types of yoga, acupuncture, and the Alexander technique, there are currently nine different training classes going on. Information about the training can be obtained from the brochure, which you can pick up at reception and from the club website. There will be a chance to talk to trainers for those interested in counselling this Saturday at 10 a.m. For yoga, etc., there will also be an informal gathering of trainers on Thursday at 4.30 p.m. So, if you are interested in becoming involved, this is your chance. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You are going to hear the rest of the talk about family history. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. So, that's a few ideas about getting information. But what about methods of recording it? Of course, you can just write down what family members say. But it's even better if you can use a tape, so that you can record them as they're talking. Then you don't have to worry too much about making mistakes. You'll always be able to listen to it again. But whatever method you do use to record information, remember that it's very important to make a note of exactly how you got it. So, if you are using tape, always start the recording by saying the date and the place, as well as the name of the person you're interviewing. So, apart from people's memories... Where else can you find information? Well, there are all sorts of documents, and they can be extremely useful. People keep lots of kinds of documents in the home, like uh, photos or letters or diaries or birth certificates. And some people keep things from newspapers, like obituaries. Obituaries are announcements of a person's death and they usually contain a lot of detail about that individual, like address, occupation, date of death, as well as the names and ages of the widow or widower and the dead person's children. So, be creative. Look around your home or the home of your relatives for any items that might contain clues, such as these about your family history. OK? Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. Now, you'll find that you'll collect a lot of information, so you'll need to record it in an organised way. 
I'd recommend that you use an ancestor chart, uh, like this one here. <laughs> Can you all see? Yeah. Ancestor charts act like maps. They link four or five generations in a family tree. So they're very convenient, and they don't cost anything. You can get as many as you like. You just download them free from the internet. Then you fill them out as you go along, and for each individual, you record all the key information next to their full name. <laughs> It's very convenient. Now, at this point, I'd just like to give you a couple of tips about filling in the ancestor sheet. First of all, I'd advise you to use pencil. At least until you have definite evidence for the information you're recording. Secondly, as well as recording official names, I mean given names, it's worth writing any nicknames down. You know, these are the short names that people call you when they know you very well, and you can show them by using quotation marks. That's ancestor charts. Then they really do save a lot of work. Now. Before I show you how to go about confirming the information you've collected, that is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. You are going to hear a lecture about the geographic information about Australia. You now have some time to read questions thirty-one to forty. Now listen to the lecture and answer questions thirty-one to forty by choosing the best answers from the choices. Good morning, everybody. We'll continue to look at Australia, and today look at one of its greatest natural challenges: water for the agricultural sector. As the only nation to occupy an entire continent, Australia has a unique environment. With much of it very flat and dry, one notable feature of the Australian continent is that it is the lowest of the continents. The average elevation is less than three hundred meters, compared with the world's mean of seven hundred meters, and its highest mountain is only two thousand two hundred and twenty-eight meters. So, it is overall a very flat country. It is also dry. In fact, Australia is the driest, after Antarctica, of the continents. Yet Australia has extremes of climate and topography. There are rainforests and vast plains in the north, snowfields in the southeast, deserts in the centre, and fertile croplands in the east, south, and southwest. And Australia contains some of the wettest areas on Earth. In western Tasmania, and on the northern Queensland coast, but half of the continent has an annual rainfall of less than three hundred millimeters each year, and only twenty percent has more than six hundred millimeters each year. A major problem is that the limited water resources do not match up with where water is consumed. The major water resources 
are in northern Australia and Tasmania, whereas most of the agriculture and people are in southeastern mainland Australia. The agricultural sector is the largest consumer of both self-extracted and main supplied water, using over 70% of total net water consumption. Electricity and gas supply and water, sewerage and drainage services use notable amounts of self-extracted water. However, net consumption in the household sector is the lowest, just 8% of total net water used. Australia's water use increased by 25% over the decade between the mid-1980s and mid-1990s. Much of this increase was due to irrigated agriculture, which, as noted earlier, accounts for over 70% of national water demand. Since the mid-1990s, the growth and profitability of irrigated agriculture has outstripped the dryland agriculture sector. Irrigated commodities contributed almost a third of total farm exports in the mid-1990s. The results of a special government report in 2000 showed that if today's water use arrangements continue, the water needs of the rural industries will outstrip water availability by about 2020. Irrigated agriculture, Australia's major water using sector, would be seriously affected by the short wall. And although groundwater underlies large areas of Australia, it accounts for only 4% of water use. So, clearly, apart from water for households, which mainly comes from dams or rivers, it is the rural sector where efforts towards water conservation are particularly directed. In this sector, the largest consumers of water are the meat and wool industries. One of the major problems in considering sustainable agriculture is the large amount of irrigated water used to produce these products. Some of the crops, such as wheat, maize and soybeans, also use a lot of water. Furthermore, many crops are grown in dry areas, where up to half the available water evaporates from the soil surface or seeps down too low into the ground for the plant roots to reach it. Well, that's all we have time for this morning. You will be able to do further study on this topic in the library, and I have a handout here with references for those who want to come out to the front to collect it. Next week, we'll look at outback farming and... That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.